Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. I'd like to welcome you to, I'm Sandy Clark. I'm president of the Seacoast African American Cultural Center. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth Tea Talk in the Eleanor Williams Hooker series for 2018 for the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, Ain't I a Woman? Um, before we get started, just wanted to remind everyone that this is being filmed. Smile. <laughs> Um, and also that we are just honored to have such a distinguished panel of professors here today. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, Courtney Marshall, who was, on, who was supposed to be one of the panelists, will not be here today. But we do have Delia Konzat, hope I'm saying everybody's name right, um, Aria Holiday, and Cabrina I'm Gardner. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, I'm just going to turn it right over to you. We have a lot to get done. <laughs> Thank you. So, do you want to show your clips first? Any order you want. So. Okay. And then, because it's established. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so, partially what we're doing is trying to figure out which parts and clips to show you first to get conversation started. So, that's what the little kind of conversation was. But hopefully, you feel inclined to engage as much or as little as you'd like. Part of this deal is for those of us who are on social media, um, there is someone live tweeting. And I, I have my phone up here, so I'm tweeting. So, I'm not ignoring you. I'm trying to tweet and live tweet at the same time. Um, and those of you who are more. Um, Oh, tech light. Of course, you can take notes in and ask questions as you'd like. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. You're good. So, um, I, I thought we'd start off with Hollywood first because Hollywood is very conservative and established. Um, they do things the way, you know, if it's not fixed, if it's not broken, they won't change it um, because their bottom line is profit. Um, and these are, um, and things are changing rapidly. Um, now, uh, before to be a celebrity, you practically had to be a Hollywood star. Mm. Nowadays, you can be an Instagram star. Um, you don't know why they're famous, like the Kardashians. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of different things, and there's um, you know music industry stars like Beyonce and all of that, and so it's no longer just Hollywood. But ho when it hits Hollywood, you know there's a change going on, and it's going mainstream. Um, but Hollywood is very conventional. So these are the common Hollywood stereotypes of women, um, and typically in most mainstream <coughs> films. Um, the, um, the woman is usually an object of desire and the reward for the hero. Um, and this, until maybe about the 90s, maybe there were some, um, uh, some, cha some um, exceptions before, um, but typically it, was, uh, um, it um, set up for white female stars and types. So um, these are the um, categories, the snob, um, upper class representation, elite status. Um, in the, uh, um, during classic Hollywood, the studio era, it was someone like um, uh, um, Grace Kelly, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, those sorts of um, uh, stars. Then the love queen, of course, Marilyn Monroe, the bombshell, silly and unintelligent. Um, then you have the prude, um, virtuous, uninterested in sex, a killjoy, moralistic. And then <laughs> there's the rebels, um, and they're subversive and anti-establishment, strong and independent, and they, um, needs to be tamed by the hero. Catherine Hepburn played a lot of these, like in um, Philadelphia. Um, and, uh, and things of that sort. The, and you can divide the um, two rebels, a super female who is feminine, sexy, flirty, and manipulative. She can be the femme fatale or the Jezebel. Um, and then there is the superwoman who is an alpha male, and she's typically associated with lesbianism because um, she can't be tamed by men. <laughs> <laughs> or works against and challenges them. Um, 
Then you have their traditional taxonomies of black women, and it's now beginning to change, and I'll show you some um, photos. Uh, you, typically, the traditional um, stereotypes, and Hollywood is all about stereotypes. Uh, they you typecast, and typically the only, um, the only one who has any 3D um, um, or complex um, char um, characteristics is the hero. Um, it has growth and more complex, um, whereas the others are more types. So um, there's the mammy or the domestic, usually a sexless or masculine woman who serves her mistress and reinforces the latter's femininity, status, and propriety. Um, the sassy la um, loudmouth um, could also be the angry black woman. Um, then there's the tragic mulatto. And then the Jezebel or prostitute. And unlike the love queen, who was just seen as silly and un unintelligent, um, the, um, the black Jezebella prostitute is associated with hypersexuality, depravity, and uncleanliness. There's a kind of, um, she's a beast, um, or something like that. Okay, let me see, what's the, is that the next one? Um, and these stereotypes are very important in Hollywood because they uphold um, the larger um, structure of Hollywood. Um, the happy ending with everything and everyone in their proper places. By the conclusion, the status quo is set and the woman, whether she was um, uh, a snob or whether she was a rebel, is usually put into the place um, and the hero has established um, um, has established everything, and everything has its proper place, um, and uh, it, you know, the status quo, it upholds that. Um, the coming together of the heteronormative couple or family. Um, think of how whenever you see a male and a female in Hollywood, and if they're shown in close-up, you know they're gonna somehow come together. Um, that's usually the way it is, unless they're um, related. And even then, <laughs> 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 Reinforcement of the status quo, um, and especially patriarchy and white middle class norms will be established. Um, and the dominance of the hero who is granted, unlike all others, a three-dimensional psychology and character development. Um, and for, um, uh, for his um, reward, uh, typically receives the woman. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about a few um, characters who, and you can see how one of the things with Hollywood, while it uses formulas, it can also get very complex, and they can draw from the snob and from the rebel and put them together. They can overlap in different ways. Um, and so I wanted to look at Pam Greer, um, because she's, she started off in exploitation films, uh, Foxy Brown, Coffee, um, The Big Bird Cage, one of these um, uh, prison things with all these gorgeous women in there, and they seduce the jailers and then plan a big breakout. Um, these sorts of things. <laughs> and what was fascinating is in Jackie Brown, which I think is one of Tarantino's best films, um, she comes back again and is an older version of that and takes down not only Samuel L. and gets all his money, but the FBI. Um, and so you, you can see how she's you doing all, she's a, so many um, complex characters all mixed in. And um, when you look at Jackie Brown and you go back to Foxy Brown and Coffee and the Big Bird Cage, you can see, um, you can read it differently as um, anticipating um, other elements. If you ignore the um, uh, major stereotypes, you can see them um, already if you read them critically. Oops. Holly Berry. Um, and you can see here how she can move across things. I think part of it is because um, she being half white, she's very assimilative and can fall more into this element here. You can see her, here she is, the Bond woman um, in Die Another Day, Cat woman, Storm in the X-Men, um, and uh, the Golden Circle. She's also done um, a, a bunch of indie films, um, uh, what is it, Monsters Ball, mm -hmm. and other various films, but you can see how she can move around and is using all these different, um, doing all these different genres and all these different acting um, elements. And I love this one, the Golden Circle, even though she had a small um, role, she's a nerd, you know, and you can see here, <laughs> Um, how that's becoming quite popular, and you can see how um, uh, you can use that as a type. 
and all the different types that she can play. Um, Viola Davis um, is extremely interesting because uh, she, a very strong actor, very charismatic, but you can see over like in the help where she was that domestic, but then breaking through that, um, in doubt she played um, a mother of um, um, a child who was on scholarship, uh, and of course fences, and in Suicide Squad she plays the, um, she heads up the Suicide Squad and she is ruthless. Get, does whatever she wants, and she's kind of a villain, um, but she's just simply ruthless. And you can see um, uh, um, all these different roles and the, the way she's playing them. And of course, we know her from TV um, um, as Annalise um, Keating. What? I don't know. How to get away with murder. Yeah, how to get away. Is it Keating? The, Keating. Her, mm -hmm. her, her character, where she's a big, a high powered lawyer and a university professor. Now these are mainstream films here and you can see how why things are beginning to change. Uh, hidden figures in which you have not just one um, uh, mathematician, three, three of them doing, you know, these sort, and this is, you know, and this, it's a Hollywood film. It's not an indie film. Um, then of course, Black Panther, um, which is a big Marvel thing, you know, and um, that has really, um, um, is really shaking things up or whatever. And you can see um, in the, during the film how they were making fun of, you know, they're really doing things with the natural hair and all of that. Um, they were calling some of the whites colonizer, you know, and th these sorts of things. But um, very, uh, um, a very um, different thing for Hollywood. Next month, a Disney film is coming out, and I think this is very incredible, mm -hmm. um, with a young 13-year-old mm -hmm. um, um, who's the protagonist. And she comes from a family in which, um, it's based on a book, um, comes from a family in which there are, um, what is it, uh, um, um, her parents are both scientists. Um, her five-year-old brother is a child prodigy. Um, and she has two other talented athletic brothers. So this is really changing all the things. And Oprah Winfrey will play um, Mrs. Witch, who's a supernatural being. Um, so I think things are very interesting. Um, indie films have always, um, a, as being outside of Hollywood, um, have always had more exciting elements. And Hollywood has always drawn from them and made it mainstream. But you can already see in 86, um, when she's got to have it, where Tracy Camilla Johns played Nola Darling. Um, uh, Chirac, Tiona Paris, very strong um, woman who withholds her sex in order, um, with, withholds sex from her um, gangster boyfriend um, in order to um, uh, stop gang war. Tyler Perry as Medea, very interesting case. I mean, this is a man whose films aren't. I'm so sorry, you get oh, to the sorry. His, his films aren't that. Great, but he has done a lot. He has broken um, this whole thing of the um, rule of three in Hollywood. The rule of three is that if there are more than three black people, um, you t um, uh, it's a niche film. And this is why people like Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, um, uh, Will Smith, uh, Samuel L., why they're alone. And if they have a family, they're removed from it. Um, Tyler Perry has completely broken all those rules. Uh, and even um, white Southerners love the Medea um, series. They're buying it up at Walmart. I mean, it's really fascinating. And this man, actually, with his bad films, that I find them interesting. I like to watch them. But he, has, he saved Lionsgate um, before they took on the Hunger Games. So he actually saved them. I mean, and that is just fascinating, that the rule of three would be broken by Tyler Perry films. And I think <laughs> it's horribly funny when um, Blade Runner 2 came out, um, Blade Runner 2045. It did very bad at the box office, but there was Halloween 2. <laughs> <laughs> breaking it in, and I, I thought, oh, that's rather funny. Um, uh, um, Kerry Washington in Django Unchained, I thought her character was a little bit odd because she wasn't as strong um, as in his other films. He's had, very, you know, like Jackie Brown or um, 
Kill Bill, in which all these assassins, um, Alfie Woodard in Passion Fish, um, which is also a very strong film, uh, and then of course Moonlight um, with Naomi Harris and Janelle Monet, um, and all of that. But um, I just wanted you to kind of think about these kind of stereotypes and the way Hollywood uses them and how things are beginning to uh, very much change. When it happens in Hollywood, that's already mainstream. Uh, and so, and there'll be progressions and regressions. They just, mm. It doesn't occur literally. It, you know, they'll have certain things like, you know, um, Black Panther and a wrinkle, a Disney production coming out. Um, with, you know, with, um, um, directed by Ava DuVernay, but then something else will happen uh, and turn it on its head. So we can continue talking about this yes. alongside um, all the other representations. Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon. Hi. It's great to join you all here for, for tea and discussion. I um, want to thank Jerry Ann um, and um, uh, the Black Heritage Can Trail you for. Into the mic, please? Okay, I have a soft voice, but uh, all right. Um, uh, I want to thank Jerry Ann and others um, associated with the Black Heritage Trail and, of course, the Portsmouth Public Library for hosting these tea talks and my fellow brilliant co panelists. Um, I want to keep my remarks relatively brief. Um, and so I wanted to focus on a film um, that actually Professor Consett mentioned in her talk, um, and that film is Hidden Figures. And so um, my research at UNH focuses on African American women's education in the 19th century Northeast. Um, so I'm not going to talk about the 19th century today, um, unless you have questions about it, but I am going to focus on the 21st century um, and ideas of education and the subject of education, particularly African American women's education. Um, the blurb for this tea talk, which you have in front of you, mentioned African American women and girls uh, and how they've been continually um, on the front lines of progressive change movements. And this is definitely true. And one of those movements is education, and that's uh, one of the points I wanted, wanted to make today. African American women have been on the front lines of sort of educational reform, um, the fight for public schooling, the fight for school desegregation, uh, and the fight for educational access and, uh, and equity, right? And the list goes on. Um, now there are actually newspaper headlines, right, claiming black women now are the most educated group in the U.S., right? So there are statistics that reveal um, that African-American women are earning um, the lion's share of associate degrees, bachelor's degrees and master's, um, and doctorate degrees um, awarded to black students. And so part of what I'm trying to say is that this achievement did not happen overnight, right? We're talking about African-American women who were active uh, for decades, so that there's a gradual process of, of activism. So we have a recent film here, Hidden Figures, that I think engages the subject of African-American women's education, but it does so in perhaps subtle ways. Um, and so I wanted to look at a couple of clips um, that I think are important to the film. And I mean, whatever critiques you have of the film, um, one of the reasons why I like it is because it portrays African-American women as multidimensional, as smart and ambitious. And so we'll see a little bit of that um, in the clips. So I'll set up each clip and then provide um, a couple of words about it. But then, of course, in, in conversation, um, I, I am interested in more of what you have to say. So this first clip opens the film. Um, it follows Katherine Coleman, who's a young African-American girl in West Virginia in the mid-1920s or so. She's in sixth grade, and she's already established herself as a math prodigy. Tetrahedron. Dodecahedron. They're offering a full scholarship. All you have to do is get there. Miss Coleman, why don't you solve the equation on the board? We took up a collection amongst the teachers and such. It's not a lot, but it's enough to help get you settled in. That's more than kind, Miss Coleman. If 
If the product of two terms is zero, then common sense says at least one of the two terms has to be zero to start with. So if you move all the terms over to one side, you can put the quadratics into a form that can be factored, allowing that side of the equation to equal zero. Once you've done that, it's pretty straightforward from there. In all my years of teaching, I have never seen a mind like the one your daughter has. You have to go. Let mommy tuck me in. Um, so as we can see, Catherine's genius earned her a scholarship to attend West Virginia Collegiate Institute. It is the only school in the region offering African-American children a high school education. And Catherine's parents uproot their lives, right, um, to make this happen for Catherine, right, so that she can take advantage of this incredible opportunity. And historically, there are so many examples of that, of African-American families moving 50, 100, 200 miles to ensure that their kids get um, a great education. So what I think this scene represents is black girl becoming. Right, and you hear that in, in the in the language. What is she? Be, what is she going to become? And this is an opportunity to see what she becomes. So the audience might view Catherine as exceptional, right? Um, but I think one of the main points of the film, and Professor Consett said this too, is that um, there are other smart African American girls that exist, right? And so the film, of course, uh, looks at the other two African American women. And there were more than that, of course, at NASA. Not so many more, but more. Um, and I think that's one of the great things about this film. You don't have a focus on just one black woman, uh, but there are multiple black women there. So I'll show another clip. Um, and this one involves Mary Jackson. Mary Jackson um, has been encouraged to seek certification as an engineer at NASA. And she has to take more courses in order for that to happen. And the only institution offering those courses where she lives is Hampton High School. But Hampton High School is an all-white segregated school. Um, and these are courses, they weren't high school courses, they were actually courses managed by the University of Virginia. And so Mary is barred from attending um, because of her race. So in the film, in this scene that I'm going to show, she peti petitions a Virginia court to gain admission to take these classes. Um, and it's also interesting that right before that, you have MLK's words. Um, so I'll capture a little bit of that. Um, and this is her as she's getting ready to go to court. And this is her, her husband and her we family. We all hit the floor. All of us realized that the bus was on fire and uh, had to go out into the mob. The kids don't need to be watching they this. They need to see this. Well, when we got off the bus in Birmingham, everybody needs to see this. Took me and forced me out of the door and threw me into the crowd, and there I was beaten by one big guy and several others. We think we are rendering a great service to our nation, for this is not a struggle for ourselves alone. It is a struggle to save the soul of America. Mary Jackson. Petition to attend courses at Hampton High School. Good morning, Your Honor. Hampton High School is a white school, Mrs. Jackson. Yes, Your Honor, I'm aware of that. Virginia, still a segregated state, regardless of what the federal government says, regardless of what the Supreme Court says, our law is the law. Your Honor, if I may. I believe there are special circumstances to be considered. What would warrant a colored woman attending a white school? May I approach your bench, sir? <laughs> your Honor, you of all people should understand the importance of being first. How's that, Mrs. Jackson? Well, you were the first in your family to serve in the armed forces, U.S. Navy, the first to attend university, George Mason, and the first state judge to be recommissioned by three consecutive governors. You've done some research. Yes, sir. What's the point? The point is, Your Honor, no Negro woman in the state of Virginia has ever attended an all-white high school. It's unheard of. Yeah, unheard of. And before Alan Shepard sat on top of a rocket, 
No other American had ever touched space. And now he will forever be remembered as the U.S. Navy man from New Hampshire, the first to touch the stars. And I, sir, I plan on being an engineer at NASA. But I can't do that without taking them classes at that all-white high school. And I can't change the color of my skin. So I have no choice but to be the first, which I can't do without you, sir. Your Honor, out of all the cases you're going to hear today, which one is going to matter 100 years from now? Which one is going to make you the first? the night classes, Mrs. Jackson. Then there's one more scene connected to that one, and it's one minute. Um, but I think it also sort of makes these points about education. Um, and in the film, Mary Jackson, you know, is she has to deal with some of the ideas that her husband has about her role and what her role should be. Um, and so you see that conflict in the, in the film. Um, so this is on the tail end of that. Um, she's getting ready to, to leave. Oh, OK. Um, all right, I can try it again, see if I can. Technology, OK. So I'll tell you. I guess I can describe the scene. It's, it's very short, one minute. Um, and um, Mary walks into a classroom, and it's an all-white classroom, and it's also an all-male classroom. And she says, where do I sit? Right? So you do get the sense of you know that it's segregated. So she, she says, I don't know where I'm going to sit. And then I think the instructor says something like, um, we don't have women in this class. Right, so there's a way in which, in, in this scene, you get an appreciation of what African American women have to endure in terms of their gender and their race. So in the, in the second clip that you saw, Mary appeals to the judge in this case by making a very personal argument. And I was surprised that this is not an argument about law or about rights, right? She's making a very personal argument and she's using the judge's history of his first, right? And hoping that maybe he sees something like that in her. You of all people should understand the importance of being first, right? Um, and then she uses that to make her case to become an engineer at NASA. She needs those classes. She wants to be the first. And I think one of the critiques of the film is that there are these scenes that are very neat. Like two minutes, she gets to go her, to her high school classes, and that's it. And we know that there are oftentimes way more struggles, um, violent struggles, than this. Um, and so that sometimes that's a critique of it. But I think these scenes of education are still very powerful. Um, I, and I would argue that they're recurrent in African-American women's lives. Um, as I said, I can trace some of these scenes back to the late 18th century, um, to the 19th century, and of course to the present. So to conclude my remarks, um, I just want to comment on what is shared in these, in these stories. Um, you see in, this, in a film like this, African-American women navigating these roadblocks to education, to schooling. And they often are going to rely on faith, on prayer, um, and love. And two, we also can't overstate the importance of family, community, and sisterhood in the fight for black educational access and opportunity. And it's one of the reasons why I like this film. And there are these great moments. There's a moment of, of all of three women sort of dancing in the kitchen, you know? So you see that there are these moments of joy, um, and there's a sisterhood, a black sisterhood there. Um, and then three African-American women were activists, right, who took great personal and professional risks, um, and they endured emotional and psychological torment on this path to becoming. So I feel like we need more films like Hidden Figures uh, that depict African-American girls and women as complex individuals within a community who often have to make difficult choices and navigate sort of racial, gender, and class oppression. So I'm really excited to see A Wrinkle in Time um, and see how that film deals with some of these issues. But I am interested to hear um, your, your comments. Um, and so I will cut my remarks and pass it over to Professor Halliday. Thank you. 
Well, my my own work at UNH um, really considers popular culture, right? So um, I was with uh, Feminist Oasis about a month ago, and we had a conversation about Beyonce and Lemonade and um, kind of current representations of, of black women in popular culture. Um, Janelle Monet, who's one of the actresses, um, she's also a singer, um, two days ago came out with two songs that represent both bisexuality and a kind of um, conversation about black women and representation. And so those are where my ideas kind of lie. Um, but rather than trying to get you up to speed about all of those things, I'll include them in my remarks. So I want to hear your questions. You've heard a lot of us talking. I want to hear you. So who's first? Questions? I'll oh, see. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, the AI woman is um, a phrase or the um, title of a speech given by Sojourner Truth in 1861, I think the, the date is. Um, and she, um, it was around the time, as you might imagine, of conversations about suffragettes and, and women's rights and the, the right to vote. And Sojourner Truth was a part of a conversation with abolitionists about what is really the importance of um, you know, ending slavery, of course. And um, she got up and made a speech at a convention where there are a lot of people making speeches about the importance and who's involved and who's hurt when we um, continue enslavement. Um, and so Sojourner Truth says um, in the speech, basically, I've done everything that is considered manly and womanly, and no one is lifting me up into carriages and carrying me and making sure that I'm taken care of, but ain't I a woman? I'm still a woman, right? So I have to do all the reproductive labor. I'm carrying kids. She talks about having 13 kids, and mostly all of them were sold into slavery, right? Um, and so she doesn't get to um, care, right, in the, in the terms of the duties of a woman that are kind of popular in the time, right, what women should be doing. But at the same time, she talks about bearing the lash, so literally being beaten um, as a slave and um, some of the other things that are part of the deal of being a slave at the time. So she's like, I'm both a man in the work that I have to do as an enslaved person, but I'm also a woman in the reproductive labor that is required, and yet no one is talking about me and people who look like me in, in this conversation of rights. Um, and so that's really where the title comes from and kind of speaks to why we're focusing on, of course, black women in this particular conversation and in this particular month. Thank you for that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> One of my favorite in history. And when I heard about the, uh, the, the tea talk today, uh, uh, in our woman, I read the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I, was thinking, I, I, I was thinking along a different line of how the presentation of your, what you were doing today. But I see the connection, mm -hmm. totally see the connection. But thank you for that, because I was going to say something about it. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to talk on at the very beginning. Um, when you were discussing some of the tropes in Hollywood, mm -hmm. that it also takes on, Hollywood tends to take on what it sees as being popular culture. Um, mm -hmm. So I know, you know, a lot of times I talk about um, voting with your pocketbook in terms of the movie, mm -hmm. but how do you see us working both ways that we address these stereotypes within culture as well so that it goes up the chain to Hollywood? Mm -hmm. I think, um First, I would say that, so my own work considers popular culture in the ways, like what happens when black women are seated in the productorial table or the creative table, right? So what happens when black women write their stories or they're the ones paying physically with their checkbooks to make sure these stories get produced, which is why Ava DuVernay as a director is so interesting to me. Um, but I think that, uh, particularly more recently than we have in the past, people have the possibility of doing both. So we have people like um, Issa Rae and the Misadventures of Awkward Black Girl that became a show, Insecure, um, on HBO, who literally was writing her own experiences as a black woman nerd in California, but it becomes a popular kind of conversation that people are a part of because of her following on YouTube. And so I think that um, kind of initially, I think that Hollywood is going to address the things, like you said, that are attached to pocketbooks people pay for. And um, 
but they usually begin with us. Those of us who are just interested in hearing other stories and doing other things, if we track those things down, you know, they get popularized through NPR or something like that. They get picked up by the news and then Hollywood's like, oh, there's money there? Let's make, <laughs> right, let's make sure that we're attached to that, right? And I, I do think that um, with social media and all of that, it makes it so much easier um, to get the message out and to um, uh, work and get Hollywood's attention. Um, prior to Twitter and Facebook and other things like Instagram, uh, you know, you couldn't really get their attention. But I do think this whole digital element now um, kind of levels the playing ground a bit and hitting them in their pocketbook. Think of um, how the high school students are u going against the NRA, and now all these companies are 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 questioning, you know, and, and it's going to hurt their pocketbooks. You know, they're they're um, these companies are moving against the NRA. Uh, those and I think a lot of this is done over um, social media. Right. I would just add about hidden figures um, and, and to underscore Professor Consit's point that if there are more than three African Americans or, or black people in the film, it's considered a niche film. And I think that was a worry with hidden figures. Mm -hmm. um, and so it had a $25 million budget, but at the end it ended up grossing something like $230 million, $240. That's a huge box office smash. And I think films like that are going to help African-American filmmakers, African-American actors, African-American writers, um, so that th these kinds of films aren't seen as niche or genre films, mm -hmm. but that they can attract a wide audience. Um, and I think with Black Panther, you see that recently, too, where right. a lot of African-Americans are going to see that film multiple times. Other people are seeing it, too, but there is this sense that we can support films with our pocketbooks, we can see films multiple times, um, and hopefully that'll bring some kind of change to, to African-American representation. Right. I just wanted to add, too, that Oprah Winfrey is included a couple of times in some of these films, and I think she's a really important, um, she plays a very important role in the ways that these um, kind of niche mm -hmm. markets perhaps become popular, mm -hmm. um, because I think um, in some of my work, I talk about stories about Cinderella and the ways that we play up. It seems black women are always able to play Cinderella as if they can't be anybody else. Um, they could be Cinderella, like we start from nothing, you know, uh, the story plays out. But um, uh, Deborah Martin Chase, who's a producer who's worked with um, Whitney Houston um, a lot in those early films and, and kind of smaller films, uh, she did a lot of work on the producer side. She produced, you know, Princess Diaries and some other popular films. But she's a black woman sitting in the producer's chair saying, hey, we're going to make money from these things. Let me show you how it happens. Um, and Oprah Winfrey has played um, a really particular role both in I mean, in film and TV and in a lot of ways um, to making things like that happen. So I just wanted to I kind of her, underscore her, her point. television thing also has, you know, one of the things with television is, unlike film, where you're larger than life, mm -hmm. television, it's intimate. And mm -hmm. that person is in your home. Mm -hmm. And I think this is um, one reason why Donald Trump was elected. Um, and yeah. because he was on reality TV show. And I think yeah. also this love of Oprah. People just love her. And, you know, and, and, all, and you know, everybody gets a car. Everybody gets a car. <laughs> <laughs> how can you not love that? Everybody gets a car. And, and I think without her television appearances, yeah. how she's, uh, her, her stardom and her celebrityhood would not be the same thing. Right. Um, same right. Thing. I want to just attach, I love that you talked about Tyler Perry and how terrible his films are, but I, I wanted to talk, I, I agree, um, but I, I wanted to just touch on one thing. I thought it was interesting that you said he changed this kind of rule of three or niche film, and I, and I thought to myself, he changed it by playing a black woman, though, yeah. which is just an interesting idea, right? That like the role that he's playing as producer and director, and he, his name, if you read the credits on this film, his name is in there like 20 times. Yeah. You're like, okay, how many checks are you getting, sir? Um, but part of it is by kind of crafting these stories of black women that he was yeah. privy to as a child. And so this whole Medea character or Medea or whatever is attached to his grandmother and kind of ideas from her. And so it's just interesting to me that he is so popular um, and relatable. He's in the house, too. He, he has all these shows. Right. And Oprah has seen the light, perhaps, from Tyler Perry. And I mean, Oprah Winfrey's channel is kind of Tyler Perry's channel at this point. So. What's fascinating with Tyler Perry is that when he is Medea, he, I mean, when, when he's in the film as, him, or as a, a, a male, he's not that interesting. 
But when he's Medea, he just, I mean, really, you just fall in love with that woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's so interesting because um, Tyler Perry himself is not a very nice guy. I think um, Medea would throw a grit ball at him. Uh, <laughs> And it, I think this is fascinating that that character, it's that, and, and, and uh, you know, he just comes alive when he does that character. Because I think it is a part of like, you know, just African and Romer American traditions of storytelling. Like you, you sit down and you listen to these stories and you animate. I think, you know, um, my family is here in the audience and, and part of 90% are I think of all the stories that we tell are animated. They're always, let me show you how it happens. You have to be there and you have to get all of the parts. And so you're playing both people in this situation and you know, like it's very animated. And as I think, you know, he comes alive when he becomes Medea because he is, enacting that kind of storytelling background um, that is clearly a very much a part of why he's famous at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you have a mic. No, I haven't forgotten my question. Good. Uh, <laughs> uh, Angela Matthews, and I'm uh, on the board of the Black Heritage Trail. So my question has to do with art imitating life or life imitating art, which mm -hmm. sort of is what this conversation is circling around. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, I've been watching advertising and noticing more and more the biracial families yeah. that show mm -hmm. up in advertising yes. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the tipping point and that wonderful Malcolm Gladwell book, um, I thought it was wonderful, I thought it was great, it said a lot to me, spoke to me. Uh, is, is this a movement becoming a trend? A, a trend becoming a movement? Is, this, is, is there something in this? And, and even beyond the advertising, seeing prominent people of color in um, roles on um, television news shows. I watch a lot of MSNBC, but even beyond that particular liberal channel, there's um, networks that are carrying uh, in tandem a white anchor and an, an anchor of color. And nightly news show um, Lester Holt mm -hmm. is, anchors one of those key evening hour shows. So what, what are, oh, you're looking like, that's a very yeah, interesting reaction. I'm sure. mm. So I, I would love to hear your reaction about that because, well, it's encouraging to me. So if I need to be discouraged, let me know. No, I would never tell you that you need to be discouraged. I think the things that you are excited about are the things that you continue to, again, pay, pay your money to, right? I mean, the, by viewership, by listening, we pay our money to these things. I only, I had a pause list thinking about the representation of, of people of color in news in general, news anchors and such, because, you know, in the past two years or so, there's been kind of a backlash around what what they look like. And so Lester Holt is a particularly interesting um, representative because he's very fair skinned and kind and he has dropped a lot of the vernacular um, in in intonations in his voice that maybe differentiate him from what we might consider non white performances of speech. Um, and so listening to him, I wouldn't know it was Lester Holt unless I heard him say, I'm Lester Holt, uh, if, if that's clear. Um, but someone like Don Lemon or um, Grin Eiffel, there, there are others who perhaps are not as um, transferable um, to particular audiences. I don't think get the same um, support from networks to do the work that they do. And there's, even in the past year, maybe six months, there was a new news anchor in Texas, I want to say, who a black woman with very big hair, you know, some, some of us get really curly, full hair, um, naturally, and she um, wore a dress similar to the one I have on today, and she was ridiculed on Facebook by a couple of followers about how she could, how could she dress like a a whore on television as a news anchor. Um, and yes, so y'all are like, oh yes. Um, and of course I know about these things because of social media, right? But she, there, beca there became a campaign about what kind of representations we support and like. And she is of course a great following of people who are like, I don't care what she dresses like. She has an amazing body. She can dress how she wants, whatever, right? But I think there is constant conversation and um, as Delia said, progression and regression in the way that representation happens. And so I think the, the art imitating life and life imitating art, I think that you're right. I think there are a lot more um, 
mixed race representations on television, particularly in ads. Um, but I, th I think it's interesting who is chosen to represent mixed race identity. Usually they're very fair skinned, loose curl pattern in terms of hair, straighter, um, lighter, fair complected types of folks. Um, and I'm, so I'm just interested in what that means, right? That we can talk about mixed race identity if it looks a particular type of way, right? If it's digestible to a general audience. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm encouraged and discouraged at the same time. Yeah, it is very middle class as well. Uh, there's yeah. this one commercial about insurance or whatever, and the two older, um, their grandparents, and they said, we're worried about our insurance, and we, we want to live our family, you know. And they have a little girl, and she's playing with the dog, and she's clearly mixed. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, oh, you know, they've had a, a mixed, you know, they have a mixed family or whatever. And they, it's interesting how they focus on that young girl. She's there playing with the dog and doing these things, and they put it in, a, a how, in front of a house and a white picket fence. And again, it's as if you can somehow whiten the blackness mm -hmm. and it makes it then okay. And that, that's one of the things with mainstream Hollywood. And this is, I didn't want to say that about Holly Berry, but she's presented as that often because she is half white and she can easily move into different, and that's why I put up Viola Davis who cannot as much um, move into it. And so I, I do think that's interesting. How, you know, like where are we gonna get the stars who are gonna be like Nicole Kidman or um, Kate Blanchett, Kate Winslet, where they can play all through the norms. Um, I just don't know how that's going to be, even though I'm hopeful, I don't know how that's going to be done. Mm. And just to make a quick point about advertising, I do remember there was a backlash um, in the Cheerios ad, wasn't yes. there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think there's more mixed race children. Um, mm -hmm. And so childhood being, you know, portrayed as mixed race. I think I think it's a little bit problematic. Yeah. Um, and there's a I think a different identity that a mixed race black woman has um, as opposed to a, a black woman that's not mixed race. And so I think we want to be careful about mm -hmm. somehow like a, a mixed race black woman representing all black women. I think it's mm -hmm. um, a slippery slope. And I think it does get to ideas of whitening that or closer to whiteness that that I find. Yeah. And the middle class. Yeah. Element. I mean, they're not going to show someone living in the project. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. all of that, yeah. yeah. Um, do you feel that um, even those things which, you know, just use the term kind of amalgamations um, of the earlier ones and lead to certain kinds of constrictions of these characters? And I wonder in particular if a lot of these, you know, if there is a new kind of stereotype of black women, it's, in many of these films, it's women who will acknowledge uh, a moral, a, a, an individual morality which comforts white people mm -hmm. rather than system, you know, structural racism. And then also um, make some acknowledgement of or gesture towards white self-perceptions of innocence. You know, when you were talking, I was immediately thinking of dope and uh, um, the sassy, the sassy gay young woman in there who f is first presented almost as a male, and then when she takes off her hat, Digby, um, when she takes off her hat, then you see that she's actually a woman, um, and they talk about her being gay and how her parents um, tried to pray the gay away by taking her to church and all of that. And, and that, th this whole thing with moving with the, the dope was all about nerds and again education mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and getting into schools and doing these various things and I do there has been this thing and I think uh, um, hidden figures use that too with the glasses glasses are not often presented in film because they reflect too much and they hide the eyes and an actor's eyes are everything. And so when you put on glasses, you're really saying something about the glasses and the nerdiness. And I do think that that's one um, that that's coming out a lot. We saw the one with in the Kingsman with Halle Berry sitting there as Ginger Ale, I think her name is. Um, and she's a tech support person who cut like Q in, in um, James Bond films and I think this inert and they mix it with sometimes a sassy uh, and I think that's becoming especially because um, the, the young millennials and and the younger generation um, they're more outspoken I see that more and more becoming and 
There are some things in which they also provide the comic relief, which sometimes can even touch upon minstrelsy. Mm -hmm. um, think even of um, the role of Kevin Hart in the really wonderful in thing, Jumanji. Film. In Jumanji. <laughs> <laughs> In Jumanji, against Rock, he, he actually plays the updated minstrel. And they were very aware of that because they gave, um, um, they, they switched the other character with the high school character and made, um, made him that into that nerd to kind of bracket it and, and make it. But there is something where it goes back to those kind of minstrel elements. And he's there as the sidekick of rock, mm -hmm. this big, you know, big guy. Who is perceivably not black, even though he's black. <laughs> Which I think is, I think the one of the most frustrating things about Kevin Hart, if we're, I know we're steering very clear of black women, I'm sorry, but <laughs> you give me a mic, I'm gonna talk about it, right? But I feel like Kevin Hart in particular is, his stand-up is one thing, but in the films that he decides to, to use or produce because he has a production company that he you know forwards a lot of these films he decides to play the black friend who's going to help you be cool or give you street <laughs> cred or whatever yeah. which is a type of minstrelsy narrative that i think is really problematic especially for i'm like kevin hart where you putting your money for real like why are you why are you continuing this narrative but i think it is one minstrelsy in general is a narrative that the u.s continues to pay for, right? So since the early 1900s, people continually want to see things like that where it's the black buffoon who's making fun and helping someone be cool. Those are the narratives that continue to be paid for, so. Um, hi, I'm back here in the back of the room. Um, I just want to bring up Joy Reid because I think, I think she Reed. embraces who she is um, and, and I love the discussions that she has. She's very brutally honest. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. And Jerry Ann and I will be bringing Joy Reid to Portsmouth so we'll keep you posted. Yes. Right? I don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll do it. <laughs> well, I figured I, if I put it out there, it's got to happen. So um, I'm just going to shift the conversation away from um, Hollywood to Alabama. And, um, you know, Doug Jones was elected, which is kind of shocking that people were shocked that he won. Um, but that's another story. But I want you to address this new phenomena of strong black women being politically active yeah. <laughs> and how people are so shocked that, uh, you know, they, they, got out, they got out the vote. So if you could just address this not real new phenomenon, but how people are embracing it as such. I, no, I was gonna, I wanna talk about Joy and Reed. So I, I, I got you on the, on, the, on the Alabama conversation. One, of course, that's not new. Um, black women have been heavily participating in the ways that, and particularly in the South too, with the Highlander Folk School, black women have been particularly in, instructive in voting rights um, in, um, poor and working class communities in the South. So Septima Clark, for example, um, is a great person to go and follow in terms of black history icons. Um, but Joanne Reed, I just want to say, first of all, I love her. So if she's coming, call me. Um, but in addition to that, I think that part of her platform, Joanne Reed, I think because she is so unapologetically herself, has been kind of cast aside. Um, whereas both her show and, if we remember, um, Melissa, Harris -Perry. Melissa Harris Perry's show were on kind of at the same time, and Melissa Harris Perry had ratings off, I mean, over and above. Mm -hmm. Joanne Reed for a very long time until she had some issues with M MSNBC and left. And so Joanne Reed, I think, is uh, kind of residually famous at this point um, because people, of course, want something else to watch on the sh on on that particular television channel. Um, although I think she's awesome and amazing in her own right, I think the ways that viewers have followed her are only after there were issues with Melissa Harris Perry, who is. Um, more visibly digestible. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying to digestible. me, I'm talking about to general American audiences. So, you know, don't get touchy with me. We're working through this here. Uh, yeah, we're working through it. 
Yeah, I would just echo that there are um, black female icons who are involved in politics, you know, in the 19th century and in, in the 20th century. So Septima Clark, Clark ran citizenship schools, right, um, to educate African Americans in the South um, so that they could uh, um, get out the vote. So I, I think it is interesting, though, that a lot of headlines were like, you know, African American women come through for, 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 for Doug Jones. Oh my God, um, black women vote. Right, and, and, and <laughs> the thing is, the African American women as a whole have been a, a stable voting bloc for the Democratic Party um, for, for decades, decades, right? Um, so it's not so much a surprise. Someone actually, I think, uh, tweeted about this. They said, it's interesting that this whole case of Russian interference didn't deter black women from voting for Hillary Clinton, right? Even though uh, we know that it may have uh, swayed other votes. So I thought that was an interesting, <laughs> <laughs> interesting commentary. It's a tweet, so. <laughs> right. Is it because of social media that it appears like it's something new? I think so. Sometimes. Possibly, because I think that some things that are happening in these smaller communities, I talked about Texas earlier, talking about Alabama, some of the things that are happening away from where you are seem to be new. You're like, oh, this is happening, mm -hmm. because the circulation of social media is yeah. so yeah. large and small at the same time. I think the rule now is that we're like three people removed or something, two people removed because of social media. So I know someone that you know in this room. I know someone you know, <laughs> right? Um, either be a Facebook or something else. Um, and so I think that also has, has helped and hurt us in terms of understanding local and kind of regional and national politics in a way, right? Because it's like, oh, if it's happening in Alabama, it feels like it's happening here and it's happening there. And oh my gosh, it's such a big thing when we're talking about really small communities that are making changes because people are actively doing work. Um, I want to say, that I saw Black Panther last night, and I think it no kicked the whole thing up a notch <laughs> in terms of the conversations around race that we have to have in this country. Mm -hmm. I want every white person to see it, mm -hmm. and because it was it was a really good story, and you just really got involved in it, as well as all the authentic details of Africa mm -hmm. and the story of America. But I, I just really think that's going to get best picture, obviously, you know, and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, it is. It's I, I wonder picture. because, you know, usually Marvel, you yeah, know, but they're I, not. I've been <laughs> to a Marvel film before, and I said, oh, this is going to be, you know, yeah, violence and all that stuff, and there's right. that in it, but I think it's really going to kick, kick it up a notch in terms of conversation, because I gained so much understanding watching mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fabulous, I think it's a, it really is a fabulous movie. I saw it Thursday. I bought my tickets in January, if that tells you anything about how serious I am about seeing it. I saw it the Thursday that it came out. Um, but I, I think that, again, I can't, I can't get you out of my head about the progression and regressions. I think it is a great way to have conversations about race, but it's happening at the same time as some other kind of reductive conversations about how race are happening at the same time, right? So I don't think that we should disentangle those things at all, right? They happen simultaneously and in relationship to one another. And so I think that um, I'll table my particularly uh, interesting responses to award shows and how we can't guarantee that anybody wins anything, even if we believe it's best picture. So, um, you know, I don't know what the, the Academy decides, you know, um, about those types of things, but it is a, a fabulous film. And I think that um, if you haven't seen it, we won't do any spoilers. You need to go see it. Um, <laughs> And you oh, have to yeah. say past the credits as well. If you're a Captain America fan, you can connect some dots from there. I'm, that's all I'm saying. All I'm saying. <laughs> and it, it could win. I mean, after that strange thing that happened last year with Moonlight. Oh, my word. I mean, who would have thought that, that a film about a young, a story, the story of a young gay black drug dealer <laughs> would would win. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, I mean, evidently, they, they, you know, like, people didn't believe it either, you know, and they instead said La La Land. Um, so it, that, that may be Marvel, you know, a comic book, because usually they don't like um, comedies. It has to be a drama. It has to be, you know, certain things. And something like a comic book would just not be taken seriously enough. Um, so I'm, I, but who knows, with, with, with that whole Moonlight episode, I mean, that was just... I would have never believed that. And Ryan Coogler, who's the director, has gotten a really oh, has yeah. done some really great films. Yeah. Um, His with, Fruitvale Station, right, Fruitvale is Station is and Creed um, all got really great support yeah. from um, award 
show, mm-hmm. so possibly, mm-hmm. but I am not holding my breath. <laughs> I think if you take Black Panther and you combine it with something that I found on Facebook mm-hmm. and which I reposted, it's a teacher with a whole bunch of kids and the title is Privilege. Mm. And the teacher goes through various things that one might have had during one's lifetime that might have given you a privilege. And every time somebody matches that, they have to take 10 steps forward. Yeah. It's a race. Yeah, you can privilege. win $100 the first person who crosses the, tr- the And it brings home for non, all non-minority kids the fact that they have to work 10 times harder than the general, and it's not true of all whites, because there's plenty of whites that don't have these privileges. But it brings home the fact that most people in this culture have privileges that put minorities, people who are different, and that could include gays and you know, all the rest, who are different, in a competitive disadvantage. Mm. Yeah, and, and, we should, and we need to be aware of that and be sensitive to it. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it's um, what you, uh, Hollywood, because of the stereotypes and that are based on the fairy tale um, with the good and the bad, you have to have, if you don't have um, a bad person next to the good, it just doesn't come across. And so you have to have some sort of negative stereotype to allow the other person to become a hero or a heroine. Um, and it usually is that whole thing based on privilege or, or whatever and who should be there um, and all of that. And so if now African Americans or other minorities are going to get moved up, there's going to be someone else, I don't know whether it's impoverished people, maybe people who don't look a certain way or this or that, that are going to be slapped down and they will get. Um, it'll just be a new moving around of various things until those stereotypes, um, the whole nature of the stereotype is not taken as, um, as the basis for um, Hollywood and other established institutions, it won't change. Mm-hmm. Somebody, you know, whether they're di- gonna be disabled or not smart or a certain this, what, any kind of difference will then be taken mm-hmm. um, as a, a negative and will be used to um, glorify those who are then preferred. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go back to a question earlier that was about stereotype amalgamation. I don't know if we answered your question. I don't remember answering it, so this is me trying to come back to it. But um, I think that um, stereotypes are inherently about generalizations, right? So even if there is amalgamations of sorts, they're adding pieces of sorts, it's still a stereotype or generalization that maintains, you know, attitudes that are not about specificity or difference or diversity or any of those things. And so um, Hollywood and mostly most institutions are based in stereotype. They, they privilege certain people over others and it's based in a generalization of who those people are. And so I think that even with some slight changes to stereotypes that they will be maintained, right? Disney as a, as a company, I write about Disney a lot, right? So I'm interested in a wrinkle in time and the ways that it's represented. But Disney in general, it's all about a good and a bad. And usually the bad person is darker in hue, even if it's not an actual person, right? So I think about Ursula versus Ariel in The Little Mermaid, right? I know you're like, I haven't seen that film in a really long time, right? But Ursula is a squid who's purple and it has a black dress, right? And she's um, larger in size, she's curvy and all of this, right? And Ariel is thin and white and thin, you know, long hair and all, right? So even the characterizations, right? You could say it's an amalgamation of stereotypes of sorts, yeah. but it still maintains the good and the bad. The good always looks a particular type of way. The bad always looks a particular type of way. So I think that even as we may see some changes in stereotypes in Hollywood and other places that um, stereotypes are based in generalization and they're going to maintain themselves because, again, that's what we pay for. Yeah. Um, what is it? The Pocahontas is an excellent um, example in which you have, I mean, she basically becomes a brown Barbie doll. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know, flipping her hair and (laughs) doing that. Right, and the fact that it's named Pocahontas. 
I was wondering about, um, you mentioned lemonade oh, before, hi. and I was wondering, I know a lot of young black women were really excited when lemonade came out. Okay. And I'm interested in hearing from either of you about the narrative of black women and feminism as Beyonce portrays it. Do you want to take that one? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> well, for those who were at the Feminist Oasis conversation, we talked to, we watched the um, Lemonade. It has a whole, Beyonce has a whole kind of visual film um, that's attached to it. And um, conversations about feminism came up a bit. And I think that um, one thing that, Beyonce has helped to do is, is provide, again, co conversation points for people to talk about feminism and what it might mean in intimate relationships, because a lot of the film, if you haven't seen it, is about her relationship with um, Sean, Jay-Z Carter, and kind of the, the development of their relationship over time via um, infidelity and some other things. But I think that, infidelity and some other things, but I think that, um, I think that like any other pop culture icon, she's not gonna give us everything. Beyonce as, and not Beyonce knows the person, Beyonce the persona, right? Um, in popular culture is again a generalization, it's a stereotype. We're getting performances, Bell Hooks calls her a terrorist of sorts because of the performance <laughs> of long blonde hair, right? She's maintaining this kind of idea of, of femininity and beauty in a particular type of way. And so I think Beyonce at the end of the day is getting checks and she's going to make sure that she gets her checks. And so even as she might <laughs> even as she might want to be creatively different in certain ways, she's going to maintain certain narratives and stereotypes that are going to make sure that she gets her paychecks. <laughs> Hi, I have a question about um, how pop culture elements do or don't advance the struggle, you know, the struggle of women for equality, the struggle of blacks for equality. And here I'm thinking, in the 70s, we went through a period of some breakthrough television programs. Mm -hmm. Archie Bunker, the portrayal of blacks and that. The Jeffersons, uh, Sanford and Son, mainstream shows that aired in my living room every night that yeah. seemed to be, you know, a breath in the wind. They didn't really advance the struggle. Are we at a point now where things that are happening in pop culture uh, with celebrities uh, of color uh, are going to have a significant difference than those shows of the 70s, and we're going to see some real progress. I know you don't do TV, but I want yeah. you to say. <laughs> I'm wary of that, um, and precisely because it's all so commodified. We are in an aggressive capitalist society, and you know, money is, you know, you get someone like Beyonce, at bottom line, she's going to continue um, making those dollars. And this is the same thing with all of the, um, uh, the stars uh, doing all this, whether television or not. That's the bottom line. And uh, I just don't, you know, when you, that I don't think is going to be any sort of lead to any meaningful activism or any meaningful change. I think it'll be, it, it, you can use it to help critique um, and do certain things, but I don't think the answer will be in that precisely because of all the commodification and consumerism. Oh, I was, I just wanna add to that. I'm, gotcha. I just wanna add to that, that I think when we talk about struggle, I think we say like capital S, like the struggle, right, the, the big, all of us are trying to move forward wherever forward is. But I think that, and I tell my students that that struggle happens at the individual and most intimate levels. And so I think that um, if we're talking about a changing of ideas, right, the, the belief that black people or black women or anyone who is different um, is inherently a person, right, is humane and regular and normal and deserves all the things that anybody deserves as a person, then yes, I would say films like Black Panther or you know representations with Beyonce or anybody else may provide those avenues that people feel more connected to. And so they can start to see people who are unlike them as like them. And that is a capital S type of struggle, I think. Um, so at the level of ideas, I think things can definitely change. But I agree with Delia that when we're talking about capitalism and the ways that certain things get commodified, I mean. Yeah. The revolution there's, there's, will not be televised. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's, there's always agency, but, you know, 
<laughs> right. right. It's going to be streamed. Yeah. It might be live tweeted, right? I think that uh, agency is always possible, but at the end of the day, we all also have to live as well. And I would just add, this might it might be or exist in a, a different medium, right? So we're thinking about television, um, but I'm thinking about podcasts, right? Um, and the way there might be sort of representation of issues of struggle in podcasts. Um, also, Awkward Black Girl, right? Um, that I mean that that was great for Issa Rae, and then of course it, it leads to her having her show on HBO. But it starts as. Um, webisode, yeah, right, a YouTube web series, right, mm-hmm. um, and so we might it might not be traditional paths that we think about, um, especially with social media. You were saying this, um, it, it might not be traditional, so it's something we might might want to think about. It could exist in, in different forms in different media, and also I just wanted to put in a plug for Two Dope Queens, which is a podcast um, which HBO picked up for specials, mm-hmm. and it represents two African American women who are interesting in what they perform and how they act. But that's just an example, right? So a podcast, which anyone could kind of do with their cell phone, turns into um, an HBO special. So it, it may not follow a traditional path. I will also, if we're plugging things, I will also add that Issa Rae has had a podcast that was happening. It was like a serial. You know, I think we were listening, a lot of people are listening to like um, This American Story and things like that. It's a serial about um, a black male football player and his kind of um, journey through discussions of sexuality. It's called Fruit. Um, and it's just, I found it randomly trying to drive to Portsmouth. And um, it's just, this is a really interesting and engaging, I think, conversation. You listen to his kind of inner thoughts and his interactions with others. So if you're interested in those kind of questions, I would suggest it. I think one advantage of all this social media is that it does open up. Um, for different alternatives. I mean, yeah. even something like Cablevision, where there's so many different shows going on and it's no longer standardized. Mm-hmm. You know, when you get together, it used to be you talked about one show. Mm-hmm. Now people are talking about different Ten shows, shows. At, you know, and, and, and doing these various things. People are no longer going to established institutions. I mean, you see them falling away from NFL, falling away from this, fall, and now everyone is doing their own thing with so much out there. Um, and perhaps that um, decontextualization might help mm-hmm. and offering different um, different plays with stereotypes. Everybody's um, coaching me to, to interrupt yet not interrupt. Yes. And I just wish I was taking notes. So that's why I let you keep going. Um, I hate to bring this back to Tyler Perry. I really do. Um, but I am, have been fascinated for a long time with why can a man represent a woman, and why does that give him more freedom to represent black womanhood or womanhood in general? So if you could talk about how, what that says about feminism, what that does to feminism. Mm-hmm. Th- that to is such that a fascinating question because when a man becomes a woman, it's usually something like comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, and even in film, which is so mainstream, when a woman does it, it's no longer comedy. And it's a step up for her. Um, think of how, um, like in, in some of the popular things, uh, uh, like what is it, Barbara Streisand, where she pretends to be a, a young male or whatever, or Mary, um, was it Julie um, Andrews in Victor Victoria? Um, all these, it's no longer funny. But when a man plays a woman, and comedy is always considered lower, and this says everything about stereotypes, mm-hmm. whereas when a woman plays a man, it no longer becomes funny and we become very uncomfortable um, and something else is going on. And I think that really addresses the gender play. And it's something like when I show it to my students and said, imagine if, uh, if this you know, were different, uh, they have a difficult time talking about it because mm-hmm. it's just these entrenched codes that are there and it, it, they're hard to discuss, but there is something going on. And comedy is a very low form. Um, the Oscars will not recognize it. Um, it's, you know, tragedy is considered way up there. Um, and where is you know, a vulgar, popular art form? And that's where, you know, and when a man becomes a woman, it becomes quite laughable um, and entertainment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, I would just add to that that um, Tyler Perry, although he himself is not a comedian of 
of any kind in, in my mind because he can't tell a joke on his own and be funny. Um, but I think that he is in a long tradition of black male comedians yeah. that perform in that way. And so um, I, I think that it's part of it. I think it goes along with minstrelsy in a way. It, it's a long tradition of funny that um, U.S. populations and audiences have paid to like. Um, and so it'll continue to make money, whether it's a black man or a white man or whoever it is, because it's a type of performance that we have all, always liked. Um, but I think also um, it's successful because it is a caricature of womanhood that even women think it's funny. And so um, in terms of ideas about feminism, right, we know the the super, the, the sassy person, the one who's a quote unquote bitch, if I can be you know, real with y'all, um, right? We, those kind of narratives, those are the people that we laugh at too, right? It's like, oh my gosh, she's such a, whatever. And you can all laugh about that thing. And so I think that regardless of whether it's a man or a woman, there are stereotypes about women that continue to be portrayed. That is a part of the conversations around feminism right large that we still, I don't think even feminists have addressed um, because there are even stereotypes within, you know, second and third wave and all these, uh, I don't believe in the waves of feminism at all, but there are stereotypes about those kinds of second waivers right that are the lesbian man hating bra burning da 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 and you're like oh no I'm not that type of feminist I'm over here right so there are even stereotypes within feminist conversations that maintain a distance from those things and then we can make fun of it if we are distant from it because it's not like us so <laughs> this has been such an incredibly intriguing conversation I wanted to just say the one uh exception to the rule of women playing men and not being funny would be Melissa McCarthy playing oh. Sean Spicer. <laughs> that, <laughs> that I thought was such a breakthrough. I'm like, oh my God. And it was an insult to Sean Spicer. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if, I, I do, I'm not particularly in those, in, those, in those circles, but I wonder if it wasn't read as funny in other groups if that makes sense. I think generally it was funny SNL, whatever, but I'm just wondering if, you know, some folk who really love and appreciate Sean Spicer didn't find it funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure you can say that of, of any joke. Somebody somewhere is going to be offended. Um, just two questions. I mean, you've talked a lot about um, kind of alternative media, uh, social media and YouTube and Facebook and so on and so forth. But you haven't touched upon independ independent filmmakers. And I actually opted out of mainstream media years ago. My first probably was one of the films you referenced, which was She's Gotta Have It by Spike Lee yeah. 30 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, there's been a lot of really interesting stuff going on in independent film and with technology becoming so accessible to people mm. who didn't have the means to make films. I'm wondering what influence we can see in that changing some cultural stereotypes, changing the subject matter, the formulaic nature of what um, Hollywood puts out. Um, the other thing is my understanding is because Hollywood films are becoming more and more expensive to produce, they are tending to become more safer in what they're, more formulaic, more giving us the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and so we could expect perhaps to see more um, breakthrough things happening in smaller screens and in independent films. And then the last question is, I would love to take all of your courses and I'm wondering what classes you teach and what, whether they're available to non-matriculated students. <laughs> well, with indie film, um, um, the majority of films made nowadays, even Hollywood films, are somewhat indie. Um, it's just that they're not, they have a bigger budget, but um, Hollywood is now, since um, the Paramount case, since the 1960s when it took over, the Paramount case occurred in 49. They have been, um, their lead thing is distribution and not filmmaking. Right. Um, and so they have, they, they, they pay for, you know, you think of Steven Spielberg, um, uh, Coppola, um, Scorsese, they would give all these people money um, and they would have large things and we call them independent, but they're not truly independent. And think of how in the 
80s and 90s when indie film after Sex, Lies, and Videotapes, um, videotape um, with Steven Soderbergh became so popular. Um, and um, other things, you know, drawing from in, in, so on in the 60s and 70s. But then in the, um, in the late 80s and 90s, we have indie wood um, coming up uh, where um, Hollywood is investing more and more. And think of now, it's so hard to tell the difference um, between, uh, you know, um, Quentin Tarantino uses major, um, uh, a major studio to um, uh, distribute his product, mm -hmm. to get it out. And they're clamping down on all these things. You know, when YouTube first came out, people were excited, oh, I can put my thing on YouTube. Uh, you know, no, they're clamping down on everything, and even if technology is getting, um, is getting uh, um, cheaper, Hollywood has just, you know, held on to those distribution and prevents anything from being shown. They've clamped down on social media. They've tr trying this net neutral, you know, all these sorts of things where they want to um, uh, um, uh, take it away from the g um, general public. And so I do think the indie films have addressed a lot of elements and they always get taken up. Um, by Hollywood, that's the nature of it. Um, and think of how Miramax, <laughs> Harvey Weinstein, started off as an indie thing with the most interesting film, and then sold to Disney. And then um, once the um, 2007, 2008 recession came in, they dumped it then um, because not enough money. But they were going through that again. And think of how indie filmmakers like Wes Anderson, um, the Coen brothers, Spike Lee doesn't like to do it, but he will do it occasionally, like when he did his um, Inside Man, work with a Hollywood, um, work with a Hollywood distributor and with Hollywood producers and all of that. Um, you have to if you want to get your film out. Uh, with Chirac, he did it via Amazon. <laughs> Um, and that was kind of interesting, but Chirac didn't make a lot of money, even though I thought it was a really great film. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> that film was I terrible. <laughs> oh, no. I love it. Generally, I agree with you, Delia, but no, no. I, that, I really, no, I, I like Spike Lee, but that was terrible. Um, <laughs> I, the only thing I think I would add, and I'm not a filmmaker, and I don't necessarily understand the full, like, What's it? I, I don't think I know what it is an indie versus a Hollywood film. They're all the same. But in my mind, I haven't participated in like network television. I cut the cable like five years ago. And so Netflix and Amazon and Hulu are generally the ways that I watch films and do stuff like that. And I think that although there are oppor more opportunities through platforms like that for indie filmmakers to get their films out, that um, the model of capitalism is going to maintain the similar models of Hollywood. So even if it is a kind of indie model, um, Netflix and Amazon and others are going to maintain a, a the ways that Hollywood has made money. And so I think when Netflix first came out, um, it was almost entirely documentary films and you could find the most interesting and like really engaging things to find. And now I'm like, where are those things? I feel like they're impossible to find unless you're talking about international films, which they have a little bit of. Um, and so I think that, um, yeah, you always have to go to film festivals to get. Yeah, really I think. Good yeah, films. I think. Yeah. Cap, right, I think capitalism does a great job of of, uh, and I should say capitalists. Capitalism doesn't do anything, but people do it. So capitalists do a good job of of maintaining the means of production yeah. and making sure, as you were talking about with distribution, that mm -hmm. the ways that people are at audiences are going to have access to this information is going to be held by the people who are going to make the big bucks. And our films are only going to get worse because we are a measly 300 million um, uh, population country, whereas a billion Chinese, almost a billion Indi you know, um, Indians. Why are all the Hollywood um, headquarters moving abroad? It's because they want that, and, and um, when, you, you, when, you, when native speakers are no longer the major things that are watching, um, sh this is what you're gonna get, these big, big blockbusters um, with dumbed down narratives and <laughs> which is already bad. And it's going to get even, you know, um, you're going to start getting that because that's, what, two billion people right there. 
I mean, so we're we just need to start procreating, is what you're saying. You <laughs> <laughs> said we just need to start procreating. There are all these stories out right now in the yeah. news about how millennials are not doing anything. They're not spending money, right? Macy's right. is angry. Right. Like, right? All these <laughs> Hollywood is angry. IHOP is angry because millennials don't care about any of these things, right? So it's like, oh, well, if you're under 35, you just need to start procreating and buy all the things because people will be happy with you. Um, but I think that's what I'm like, oh, okay, we got to get to a billion. So everybody needs at least 10 kids. We can make it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that I think I think that at the end of the day, I mean, the one thing that I do appreciate about millennial generation, and I have yet to decide whether I'm part of it or not, but it's yeah. that um, we literally put money where we want it to go. Like I'm I'm not interested in having nasty food at your favorite places anymore because they don't cater to me, or I don't feel like doing or watching these films that I'm not really privy to because. They're just, you know, films and things to do. I can watch Netflix at home. Why would I bother? Right? So I think that there's the diversification of options yeah. has allowed for um, some really interesting things to happen. So when Black Panther comes out, right, and it makes $202 million in its first weekend, right, it's because people really care or are invested. It's not just kind of a happenstance, random kind of thing. Um, and when I think that we'll see, even as films perhaps get worse, people will still see, I don't know, but people will continue to maintain um, those interests and align them very particularly. And I, I wonder if there's gonna be a, an opening for local film festivals and regional film festivals to kind of that. flourish. Um, I used to live in Ohio, I saw this in Cleveland, there were sort of local film festivals um, showing documentaries and, and films. And even at those places, speaking to distribution, um, those films might be bought by these sort of larger yeah. uh, companies. So I think Moonlight actually traveled that route, yeah, if I'm yes. not mistaken. And Birth of a Nation did too, yeah. even though Birth of a Nation did not do well at the box office for a variety of reasons. But look at like what Get Out did, what yeah. was right, made exactly. for so, you know, a yeah. small amount, right. and it earned itself crazy. That's right. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God. And it's nominated for Best Picture, isn't it? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, Oscars. I have this microphone here, so I'm just going to jump in, sorry, <laughs> so I can pass it on to somebody else. I do want to hear the end of the last questioners, the answer to what classes you teach. Um, oh. However, but before we go there, I, I would hate to leave this session without hearing the panel's response to Wrinkle in Time, what you feel, you know, what you anticipate, how it will be received, what excites you about it, what, if anything, you know, um, puts you off, scares you, I don't know, whatever. Um, so if, if the panelists could speak to that and maybe just say what they teach, that would be great. I'm very excited about it, but I do have my trepidation because it's Disney. <laughs> and Disney is just evil. But then you have, it's Ava DuVernay <laughs> who is directing it. You know, and then, so I'm torn. Uh, you know, I, I, I just don't know. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, what do I teach? Um, mainly film. I'm, I'm also a specialist in um, uh, modernism, but mostly film. And I teach classes like war film, um, also race and gender in film, uh, genre, film genre, um, various sorts of things like that. I will just say I'm excited about A Wrinkle in Time. I, I share some of those same reservations. Um, I think the Oprah effect, we'll see what that uh, entails. <laughs> um, she has a way of sort of yeah, bringing people to the, you know, to the, to the movie theater. We'll see uh, you know, how that plays out. Um, I think I would say overall sometimes her films or she acts in her films don't, um, are not that as successful, at least in terms of the box office, right? If you think about Beloved yeah. and, and Toni Morris and yeah. the conflict she had there. Yeah, so, <laughs> Oprah ruined it. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, she, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm curious to see what, what her role is and, and, and how she does. Um, the courses I teach, I teach courses in 19th century American studies. Um, so that's sort of literature and history um, and a little bit of visual culture. Um, I'm teaching a course now on narratives of freedom, so we're reading slave narratives. Um, and I look forward to teaching courses on African American literature. Um, and I'm interested in teaching a course on black women writers. 
Um, in terms of a wrinkle in time, I think that um, I would be interested because it's Disney and Disney is always invested in these kind of discussions of multiculturalism. So even in its marketing, it's already being like, look a black woman, look a white woman, look an Indian woman, look, right? It, they like show all these images yeah. back to back. It's and they're so like, good. Look yeah. how great multiculturalism yeah. is. So I'm interested perhaps in how Disney is invested in that conversation, even as it's, it's great a, to analyze in class. Right. Yeah. Even oh. as there's a little black girl as the protagonist, which is the thing that I love and, you know, a black <laughs> woman director is handling it and oh there's the Oprah thing that's happening so I think it's interesting and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out um, in terms of classes um, right now I'm teaching intro to women's studies um, because I'm housed in the women's studies program woo, woo. and um, so it's really discussions about feminism and the ways that race, gender, class, nationality, and religion play into those discussions. Um, in the fall, I think I'm teaching, um, I teach a social justice leadership class or leadership for social change um, that is literally about how do we do this work that is the struggle. So thank you for that question earlier. Um, and I think I'm teaching, oh, black feminism and and popular culture. So the ways that we consider feminism, black women, representation in um, visual media and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, I think next spring is, um, I think that's, Siobhan, you can correct me. I think that's the... Um, History of twerking class, I think, is, is that. <laughs> um, history of twerking. Um, and it'll be a half practicum, so literally oh dance God. practicum. Half practicum and half theory. There will be some performances. Um, half practicum and half theory. And um, But again, conversations about visual representation and, and the ideas that we think of when people dance. Um, and then a, another, I think the feminist theory class is the other thing I'm teaching in the spring. And I think, I'm not sure what the rules are about a non-matriculating student. I think it's literally getting permission from the dean I, of, I'm in the Register. College of Liberal Arts, so I guess the Dean Heidi Bostic, I'm giving you all the information you need. Right, Dean Heidi Bostic, I think, makes decisions about who can enroll and how. So maybe petitioning the College of Liberal Arts um, <laughs> may be a way to get yourself in the door if that's what you're interested in. Hi. Hi. Um, first of all, my question is going to be about a film. Thank you. It's going to be about a film, so I want to know if you've seen the film first. Girls Trip? Yes. Okay. So I saw it last night, and I thought it was really hilarious. I love the female-centric. I love the female friendship. I think that was great. But I'm just curious about what you thought about the characters. Do you feel that they are stereotypical? Do you feel that they're more authentic? Is it even important? Yeah, I haven't seen that film. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, yeah, I've seen it. It's... I, I think that going back to the representations of, of, of women and stereotypes and black women that Delia gave us earlier, the film follows very similar tropes. There's like the funny, slightly hood <laughs> character, the Jezebel who's always talking about sex and how to get it in, and that's Tiffany Haddish's character. And then um, Queen Latifah is always is the, she's like, Oh, she's like the the bougie mammy almost. It's like her getting <laughs> it is. It's just like she's like I have money, but you know I don't want to talk about sex or anything. Oh my god! Like and she, Queen Latifah in general, is like that. Um, what's the other? <laughs> chick's name there's the really rich one who all of a sudden right who's married but all of a sudden has issues with her marriage and she has it's like a i she's picked up off her pedestal and put in her right place kind of thing which i think is always kind of played out um and then what's the other is it jada pickett smith who does she trader pickett smith is like the tragic mulatto character it's always like <laughs> uh, she right they, she starts in these kind of um matronly dresses and stuff her collars are all up here and they like go through this transformation with her to remind her that she's a sexual being and all this other stuff so i'm like i, I think that it maintains very mulatto. simple yeah, I, yeah <laughs> yes, a prude mulatto. i think that it maintains narratives about women especially in in quads i'm always interested why they're not like 
yeah. 10 black women who hang out. Like, there's always like a group of four or a group of three, um, which of course played out in Sex in the City and other kind of films like that as well, or shows like that as well. Um, but I think anytime there's like a grouping of women, there's always these roles, these kind of stereotypical roles, and they may be conflated in certain ways um, via what Delia gave us, but it's always the sign of uh, same kind of grouping of folks. I did think it was a great film though. I, I mean, at the same time that I'm like, yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's a great film in that again seeing representations of sisterhood and people bonding, um, and even though kind of the fights were very contrived, I think it was great that there were some tensious um, conversations that were had that are actual conversations that you might have with your friends. So, mm -hmm. I think it also was surprising to me is it grossed over a hundred million dollars as well, mm -hmm. right? And didn't cost very much to make. So we, again, we have another film starring African American women that does very well at the box office. There's something to be said about that. I didn't really care for the film very much. Um, I think it was sort of, as you said, kind of going for cheap laughs and using a lot of stock and, and stereotypical characters. Mm -hmm. um, I do think it's interesting that Tiffany Haddish became sort of the breakout star of that film. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, she's being, um, well, she actually uh, announced the um, Oscar nominees, right? right. Oh. Um, so she's, she's... She's hosting the MTV Video Music Awards see, in June. Yeah. Yeah. So, and she's from she's from Los Angeles, and she talks about how she's had a very um, gradual sort of um, sort of her path to Hollywood is, is very quite quite difficult. Um, she comes from a very humble beginnings. So I'm happy to see that kind of thing. But the film itself, I think, wanted to be bridesmaids, and it and it wasn't. I think it wanted to be bridesmaids. I well, think I think what's interesting there was another film, and I don't remember the name of it, but it was a very similar conversation that was had. And I think it was, the two films were a test. They were released about two weeks apart, I think, where there was a group of white women and a group of black women who all went to New Orleans to for what's the name of the rough night rough night Terrible and film. girls Terrible. trip were kind of coupled as similar films um literally the same exact narrative was being yeah. played out but yeah. with black characters and with white characters and from what i could tell and i might be wrong but girls trip did much better, much better. um but i don't know if that's about again the kind of stock characters that we're talking about um or, you know, some, I know that there were some groups of um, black women who went in to support it in particular because it represented the Essence Music Festival, that, which is something that's tied to Essence Magazine and kind mm -hmm. of um, communities that black women are attached to already. So. Hey, sis. Hey. <laughs> um, literally my sister. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, for those who don't know, um, I actually am a culinary student at Johnson & Wales University um, in Rhode Island. Um, and I came all the way up here to see my sister. Yeah. <laughs> don't clap for her. <laughs> um, but I wanted to um, direct the conversation back towards um, African American education. Mm. Um, not too long ago, I actually had a conversation with a few of my classmates um, in my American Studies class um, about how a few of the white students felt as though um, African American education is more prized now um, because you see, um, looking when you're looking for scholarships, they're like, you can get this scholarship if you're African American. You can get this scholarship um, if you, um, you know, if you have this certain GPA and you're African American. Um, and um, a lot of them felt as though it, that education has almost become a competition. Um, <laughs> she's laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm laughing. Um, foolishness. Um, and for me, it was an interesting conversation to have with them because um, for me growing up, I, al I always felt like I had to work twice as hard. Um, and seeing now, um, like Black Panther and all those other films that are elevating African Americans, um, I find it interesting when I have conversations with white people about um, how they feel about it, saying that they feel as though now they're being cast aside. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I just want to know the panel's opinion on that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question, sister. Um, well, two things. I don't think it's ever black education could ever be more prized. Um, 
without thinking about what happened during enslavement and, and reconstruction, right? So there are, there are um, enslaved Africans who are literally getting fingers and, and toes and all kinds of things cut off because they held a book in their hands. So I'm not sure that we could talk about it being more prized now than it was previously when body parts were being cut off or people were killed for opening a book. So that's read a history illegal book that's read. there. Yeah. Um, right, it was a, literally illegal to read. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't understand how it could be more prized at any other time when it was illegal previously. I mean, that seems like an overgeneralization. But I think what the students that you're talking about are trying to get at is um, feeling that the tide of white supremacy is changing. And um, good. I don't, you know, I just, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to respond to that because I think that, you know, students, um, first of all, affirmative action or the Equal Rights Amendment when it, uh, when it was first passed was, did not really include African Americans in the first place. It was a place to include white women in conversations and, of employment and, and education. So that's A. And then B, I think that um, there are more um, communities that have made sure that they are philanthropic efforts tied to African Americans, which is why we see scholarships and those kinds of things available. Um, so literally, there are more people making more money to contribute to black students getting an education. Um, and so I think that's a possibility. But there are still thousands and millions of dollars attributed to institutions where white kids can go pretty much for free. So I think I, I, I'm struggling with that because, I mean, the histories of places like Harvard or Georgetown or Yale, right, they've been in the news recently when they're trying to deal with their racist past or whatever. I think it's, I mean, you literally made money from the enslavement of people. I don't, I don't know how we could, I don't know. I'm, I feel like I have a lot of things that in, my, in my head, and I just would want those students to come see me. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, think, I think that people are struggling with this particular moment in history. People are struggling with conversations that we've had for a really long time, and that they are just more apparent via social media. and like People are willing, more willing, I think, to have those conversations and are confronted with them a lot more. And so it's not a conversation that's seated in the background in their minds, but they... Um, feel like it's necessary to voice. Um, but I think it's great that they want to have those conversations. I tell them they need to come to things like this and expose themselves to other folks and other um, mindsets that might provide more context and also to do their work and read mm -hmm. because there are plenty and plenty of books that talk about these things. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. But I do think that a lot, of, some of the blame is on the way um, universities handle affirmative action mm -hmm. <laughs> and the tokenism that goes on there and the way it's, um, and, and I think that leads to this representation where there's more scholarships as, because sometimes they present it as that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I do think that, you know, um, that just adds, mm -hmm. um, and adds to it. And, in addition, you have these powerful universities, whenever they do um, put aside spaces or whatever, they make a big deal about it because they want to be seen as doing that. Whereas this has always been, you know, the hiring of people. And you look at the statistics um, and what's going on, it's obviously, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's all not going to African Americans or minorities. Um, let's just say it that way. And um, but when positions are given away, it's broadcast everywhere. They do a lot. Um, and I think that creates hard feelings. Mm. I, would, I would just add that schools have always been a battleground. There's always been this competition. Yeah. Um, and when I look at the 19th century, I'm looking at public school and the rise of public education. Um, and African Americans were either excluded entirely from public schools in various northern states, or they were, um, they were excluded altogether, or they had to be segregated. So I think this is part of the history that your classmates and peers need to be aware of, right? There, there wouldn't necessarily be scholarships for African Americans if the playing field had always been 
the same, right, or had been equal. So you have African American activists in the 19th century who are always fighting for equality. They just wanted the same opportunities um, that other groups had. So I think that's something that, um, yeah, I mean, you know, a history of education course might be good for for some some of your peers. And Rhode Island's particularly interesting because it's one of the um, one of the first states to actually desegregate its public schools in 1866. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some his there's a lot of history there, a lot of interest. And Rhode Island is also one of the major leaders in the African slave trade. Um, and Brown University oh, made, Brown. A, yeah, yeah. made all a their money huge came amount of from money slavery. from slavery, from slave ships. Mm -hmm. I don't really have a um, question. I just wanted to say this has been absolutely wonderful, absolutely informative. But I want to go back a little bit to Tyler Perry, and I know all of your... <laughs> <laughs> I know how everybody feels, but for me, um, my background is theater. And I want people to remember that Tyler Perry started, started out on You're the right. stage. Right. Yeah. And what he did, the, his beginning, you know, he was homeless. He was in mm -hmm. the, you know, sleeping in a car. So for that, I am so proud of him for where he was to where he, he is. He also introduced so many black females, male actors and okay. singers to America. Mm -hmm. So for that, I think he deserves his kudos. You're right, some of the movies, not quite so much, but he, that's he's done for mm -hmm. our people and that I appreciate about him. So I just wanted to make that little comment <laughs> 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 that he gave a lot of black people work. Mm -hmm. And well, I appreciate right. that. And, and I think one thing that, in terms of news that I saw recently is that part of partial parts of Black Panther were filmed in Tyler Perry Studios. And so he has, you know, the production company, he has studios where people are filming films. I mean, I, I think that he has provided opportunities, film, television, production for many people, especially when you're trying, coming from humble beginnings. So I think that, you know... I don't have an issue with his hustle. I got an issue with how it gets represented right. yeah. <laughs> um, at all. I, I, lo I, I love the smart. He's very smart, and I think that's amazing. But I just am like, you know, on on the black on the backs of black women with particular tropes that always seem to position dark skin folk in general in a negative light. I have I have the same thing to say just quickly before I pass this on. I mean. Uh, I was thinking about all of the housewives of wherever or um, basketball wives and all of those um, reality shows that really relies totally on stereotypes. And yeah. I remember listening to an interview with Amorosa once mm. oh. and she said that if she hadn't played to the tropes, to the stereotypes, that she would never have been noticed. And she was able to use that visibility to propel her to political fame or infamy or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So um, she she's been very smart about yeah. doing that, playing. But, to but it. she said that's exactly. Mm -hmm. Or she said the cameras would never be on her because yeah, she started exactly. off in The Apprentice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is for uh, Professor Kanji. You mentioned earlier on that outside of the Madea persona. Uh, Tyler Perry wasn't a very nice person or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in knowing how you came to that opinion. Well, he said something about women being dirty and he was attacked in the news for mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago. Yeah, yeah. And so that right there really That's bothered me. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> ooh, I'd like to do a grit ball on him. <laughs> 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 So it was a, along the, those, and, and I have to say, um, you know, a lot of these uh, um, ma these directors, they're not nice people. They, you can't be almost, mm. or you will not get to where you should be. Um, and, you know, but I didn't like him saying these things about women being dirty, blah, blah, blah. And I think he and Terrence Howard said things about women, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> And so that, that's where I got that from. But I do agree, he has done quite a bit, and he has broken that whole that's rule of three. I mean, it's incredible. White Southern um, Christians love him. And they're like going crazy, buying out his box sets at Walmart. That is incredible. That's incredible. <laughs>
<laughs> we have time for one or a couple of questions. Hi, I'm Kevin Wade Mitchell. I'm with the Black Heritage Trail, and I'm also a light-skinned actor. <laughs> okay. Represent. Okay, so we got a little bit of problem here. All right. <laughs> now, I'm not in Hollywood or anything, but basically, I've felt a lot of uh, pressure being a light-skinned actor because a lot of times, people are looking for actors of color, mm -hmm. and they look past me because I'm not dark-skinned. Yeah. Okay. They and did I can that play with Lena Horn. They browned right. her up. Right, and I can play the I can play the role just as well as anybody else. Yeah. And another thing, I also mm -hmm. think uh, sometimes I'm not black enough for black people because mm -hmm. black people see me as a problem because I'm not as dark skinned as them, mm -hmm. and they wonder why I'm getting these roles and somebody else who's darker isn't getting these roles. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, we all we all represent the race. We all uh, represent the black community. So, I mean, I'm a product of the Elmer Lewis School of Performing Arts, Boston, Massachusetts. That's where I got my training at. And I get roles because I'm damn good at what I do. Right. And that's what the, that's what the bottom line is, mm -hmm. okay? It don't matter if I'm fair-skinned or if I'm dark-skinned. It's because when I'm on the stage, you're gonna go home and remember something. Right. So, so I don't think there's any special privilege between light-skinned actors or dark-skinned actors. I mean, well, I mean, like I said, I'm not in Hollywood. No. No. I'm, not, I'm not in I, Hollywood, I, I, yeah. I, I, you know, so I'm not talking yeah. Hollywood. I'm just yeah. talking about my own career personally yeah. and the trials and tribulations that I've been through. Right. They don't see me as a safe black, okay, even though I'm light-skinned. They still see me, they still, a lot of times they see me as a thug or whatever, looking because they still see black. They don't see, oh, he speaks well. I'm comfortable with him. <laughs> I don't get that at all. For some reason, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's my attitude, I don't know what it is, but I don't get that at all. That, I don't come across as that being safe and I'm not getting any special privilege in what I do. So that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> I would say this past week in the Intro to Women's Studies class with my students, we discussed Kimberly Crenshaw and intersectionality. And so if you haven't seen her TED Talk, I would also pub that to you if you mm -hmm. haven't seen it. But part of the idea of about intersectionality is literally it's just a framework or a prism to see the ways that multiple parts of our identities are used to oppress us, right? And so I would say that although you are, um, as you describe, a light-skinned actor, I think that there are ways that um, your um, performance of masculinity may be read in ways that might perform for them an idea of a thug, right? Or um, how you present yourself in a room always, I think, light skin, dark skin, whatever, I think always gets read in particular types of ways. And so um, at another, I think at the Black Heritage um, Trail Conference in the fall, I talked about you know, how my mother, who's also here next to my sister, my mother also made, you know, she made the point of saying, you know, when you, you can't control the way that people are gonna act towards you, you can't control the ways that people are gonna perceive you, but you can control you. You can control your, repu your, your reputation. And so I take very seriously the way that I go out into the world and perform myself, but I know that when I show up in the room, people see what they see already, right? Because our brains, even if people are like, oh, I'm colorblind, whatever, which doesn't exist, right? <laughs> we know that our brains categorize people and things automatically before we do anything. Our brain is like, oh, yellow shirt, brown shirt, red shirt. I, I tell my students this all the time. Your brain does this automatically, and as soon as it sees something that's not the same, tie-dye, for example, your brain's like, oh, tie-dye. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a there's there's a alarm kind of that goes off in your brain that slows you down a bit and you have to reassess and then you move on. And so that's why I say colorblindness doesn't exist because your brain is automatically doing it for you. You can't not do it. Um, but I think that there are lots of ways that we get read in public because of the kind of scripts and stereotypes that are performed for us. And so I think it's awesome that you have this reputation of being an actor who handles his own on stage. But I think that also when you go into castings, they know who they're looking for, right, in certain ways. And whether or not you fit that description is also based on your performance of your identity in those spaces. Yeah, and I do think, you know, like the um, core of the way Hollywood lights, it's that three-point lighting system. And I'm not saying that the lighting system is racist, but that the way it presents the, you know, the norms, uh, you know, like to, to uh, you know, when Sidney Poitier, who's very dark, they, the, um, they would all, and you, if you look at his performances, he's always sweating because for them, 
um, for the um, uh, people making the film, they wanted him to appear caramel colored because they thought he would be more, um, they, they, that it would be better to get box office things in all of that. And so it, it is so fascinating how something like Moonlight, uh, the way that, oh, the colors, mm -hmm. um, just amazing. Or the way some um, a cinematographer like Bradford Young or um, um, Spike Lee's um, cinematographers, both Matthew Libertique, who's Filipino, um, but also Ernest Dickerson, um, who now does um, that that zombie film, zombie mm -hmm. television thing, Walking Dead. Walking Dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he films that now. <laughs> but um, they really were, and and it, in the three point lighting system, it's very difficult to capture darker skin and darker hair because um, the darker you are, you absorb the light rather than reflect it. And, and I, I think uh, um, and we now have these cinematographers who are doing that and Bradford Young who did Selma um, uh, deliberately does not use um, that three point lighting system and prefers natural lighting in order to capture the different colors of African Americans. And I, I think, I'm, I'm wondering how that's going to change certain things. Mm -hmm. You know, and in Moonlight, you could see that you were lost in everyone's faces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were, and it took so much time because you have to set the lighting for each skin tone and flatter mm -hmm. that skin tone. Mm. So one last question. <laughs> um, as we get ready to leave, I'm wondering if you can share with us who you're looking at, like who you're watching, who you're excited about as directors, as actors, as writers, who we, sh who you're reading, who we could be looking for as to kind of expand our knowledge and as we go off and lead our lives. Mm -hmm. I'm excited about the new cinema. I love cinematography, and I really think you know films are not about plot. In the traditional sense, it's about those visual images and the sounds. And so cinematographers who capture that, and someone like Bradford Young, um, and all of that, and how they're doing the lighting um, and working with that. Uh, there's also um, uh, other ones who are um, non uh, who are white, um, such as Roger Deakins, um, the amazing um, Mexican cinematographer Chivo, um, who did Children of Men and Birdman. Um, just incredible stuff, and I'm really excited um, looking at those people. And then also, um, what is Ava DuVernay? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just like on tender about that Disney thing because I don't like Disney, but. <laughs> I'm, you know, it's kind of stealing myself for that. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> yeah, I would say um, there, there are two people I think that I, I am excited about and I follow and I like stalk everywhere that they, three people that I stalk everywhere. One of them is Denai Guerrero, who's in Black Panther. Oh, wait, she was um, in that red outfit? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Denai <laughs> <laughs> is just, Phenomenal in every way, as far as I'm concerned. Viola Davis is also a part of that clan. So anything they're a part of, I'm like, I need to all to get it. Um, in terms of actresses, um, Ever Duvernay, we've already named um, multiple times. She's just phenomenal, I think, as a person, um, but also in the way that she takes her um, directorship. Um, she does the show Queen Sugar. Um, on the own channel and that show if you uh, think about cinematography and lighting and all of that it's like every single episode feels like a film and you're just wrapped in all of it and so that in general is just amazing she is amazing to me Ryan Coogler is also who's oh, the director for Black Panther very Panther. exciting director um, yeah. love him mm -hmm. um, and then I think in terms of a writer who I'm I am I feel like I, I fall in love with her and then I'm like, okay, what is she doing? And then I fall in love with her again because it ends up being genius as Roxane Gay. And which is interesting because I think she's both a memoirist and a fiction writer and nonfiction writer, but she also has been involved in um, writing the screenwriting, some of these comics and things. Um, for example, Black Panther is a part of that, and there she's been tapped for some other things. And so I just think she's a really phenomenal writer. Um, most recently, I read her book, um, Hunger, um, that talks about weight and just general, the things that we hunger for and the things that we feel in those spaces. Um, and so um, and that book is just, I'm trying to figure out how to teach it because it's amazing. Um, and so 
Her, I think um, another writer is um, Jacqueline Woodson, who won the National Book Award last year, I think, is amazing. Um, and then Tayari, what's her last name? Jones. Tayari Jones, who her book, An American Marriage, just got added to Oprah's book club or whatever, is also a really great writer. Um, I think in addition to, to those recommendations, um, I would recommend DuVernay's documentary. So maybe yeah. you've seen her film, but she has a great documentary called 13th, um, mm-hmm. which is on Netflix, right? Yeah. I think Netflix might have um, funded it partly, yeah. too. So, I oh, think yeah. so. Um, it's a great documentary about the 13th Amendment. Um, and I'm looking forward to Issa Rae's Insecure, season yeah. two. Um, which is start up. Oh, I forgot Atlanta. Atlanta. Uh, yeah, that was things. yeah, that was great. That was great. <laughs> right, these sort of natural hairstyles that Isari was wearing. Um, and then in terms of, of books, um, this is sort of a we've all heard of Toni Morrison, but I think one of the books we forget about that she wrote that's really important and actually speaks to this issue of colorism is the bluest eye. Mm. And I think when we're thinking about colorism um, and light skin, dark skin, that kind of thing, we have to think about the way gender plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think Morrison does a really good job of capturing what it means uh, for this young black girl, speaking of black girlhood, right, what it means for her to um, deal with these issues of of color. Um, So those those are my recommendations. This has been wonderful. I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like you to all continue clapping for our wonderful panelists. And I would like to to remind you to register for the next Tea Talk. And I would like to invite up the president of the Black Heritage Trail of Portsmouth, Reverend Thompson, for some closing remarks. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you, little sisters, for what you did today. (laughs) Uh, I had a couple of notes. First, does everyone know what twerking is? Anyone, does anyone not know what twerking is? Okay, then then just kind of hang out here and, and one of these sisters, will, no, will, one of these young no, women will, no. will demonstrate. I will say Google. Uh, but, uh, but twerking is a dance, just so you know. And does everybody, does anyone not know who Beyonce is? I just want to check, just to make sure. And does anyone understand that lemonade is not a drink in this case, but it is a video? Okay, that's some basic things. I just want to make sure. Um, uh, you were wondering about why it's always four women. Well, when I was a student here at Phillips Exeter, in 69 and 70, if there were three black guys walking downtown, we would notice the police begin to circulate. Mm. So uh, three is a magic number mm. in terms of racial relations. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Three is it's a magic a number. Mm-hmm. Um, um, mm. I, uh, I just want to also say that um, um, I was inspired by Black Panther because of the role of the women. Uh, and I didn't, maybe you talked about it before I got here. Did y'all talk about Black Panther and women? We, y'all should, so y'all, y'all missed the whole thing. This is the, the topic of this afternoon is Ain't I a Woman? And y'all didn't talk about women in Black Panther. Okay, just so you know, all of you haven't seen it yet. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you are tired of analyzing or the, what you've heard about it as a groundbreaking, groundbreaking film for blacks, just think about the women. <laughs> just see it and think women. And you'll enjoy it amazingly. You'll see it in a whole different way. That's my, that's my advice. You didn't ask for it, but I'm giving it to you because I'm up here in front of y'all. <laughs> and because and I'm a preacher, and that's what we do. So, I, you know, so thank you for letting me be myself. Um, I want to also let you know that uh, if Roxane Gay comes, and she has a New Hampshire connection. She's a graduate of Phillips Exeter Academy, mm-hmm. uh, which is, uh, so she understands what it's like to be black in an environment that's not. You can speak with uh, authority about that. And color prejudice, I just want to know, Kevin, you, where is he? he? He was, there you are. You know, I believe you, you know, you, know, you, look, you, look, you look thuggish enough for me. I'd hire you any day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, 
I had one, one observation about uh, the commercials, and yeah, my wife and I have been noticing how many interracial commercials there. But what before that, I noticed that all the people are about the same color. If you're black or white, then you're about the same color. It doesn't matter. If you're, if you're a white person, you've been out in the sun a lot, and you got a nice suntan. And if you're a white person, then genetically, you, you, know, you should have been out in the sun some more. So, so it, what just, it's just amazing. Not only are these they're just about the same shade, just about the same shade. That's just so interesting. I, I don't know what the subconscious messages and I don't know why it's uh, advertising is pushing this but you know you know you, you, you. okay the next the next tea talk I want to thank Jerry Ann Bogus whose vision guides the work of the Black Uh, Jerry Ann thinks up these tea talks. I'm thinking about the tea talks. I got. I think she's got all next year's together and all figured out already. That's kind of <laughs> the way you have to do it. But I'm so grateful to her for her vision and for the way that it pushes all of us. Uh, I find hope here, uh, and uh, not just because you can look here and see there really are more than six black people who live in New Hampshire. <laughs> Sometimes it can feel like that's the case. I'm just telling you, just telling you, it feels kind of lonely sometimes. But, but uh, not only that, but because of the quality of interaction and engagement that all of you have brought to these tea talks, uh, the, the depth of the questioning, and the fact that I know that if you're in this room, you're thinking more deeply about matters that have bedeviled our nation and perhaps even civilization uh, as long as we've been trying to live together. So uh, I'm grateful to all of you. You are my hope for the day. Well, not the only hope I hope for the day, but you are also my hope for the day. Uh, last week, uh, as we closed, I closed with a song. Today I want to just close with a joke. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Omarosa Manigault. Thank you very much. Oh my God. <laughs>